sorry, go for it. All right, so uh, thank you all for uh, coming. I, um, I can imagine giving up a six o'clock hour to be here at this point after you've all had a very busy day. Uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, your time will be really worthwhile well, uh, well spent. Uh, so I could imagine that we are all here gathered because one, we either very curious about travel or two, we have some type of inquiry about it and uh, you will not be disappointed. Um, I met Alfred, I don't know, how many years? Sometime back, you know. So his sister and I go way back, we went to the same institution and she told me, you know, uh, my brother does this thing, uh, by this time I was still in California and then he came and visited my class and that is one of the best presentations I ever heard, you know, from somebody. My students were equally, equally, you know, moved by that presentation. And since then, I've always held it in the back of my head that if I ever got a chance, or whenever I got a chance to have him speak to students, I would make use of that. So, um, without taking too much uh, of uh, your time, I'm going to invite uh, Wilfred. Um, you've seen uh, the flyer. Uh, he's a man with so many accomplishments, you know, for me as a black man. I look at another black man who has scaled, you know, Everest, I'm like, wow, what a fit, you know, that is not something we Africans do. So how in the hell did you get into this? But nonetheless, now his story will be very inspiring. And uh, hopefully at the end of it all, um, we'll walk away here with uh, something to smile about. So uh, without any further ado, we'll pray you take the stage. Just a short story about myself. Um, I come from Tanzania and uh, I am a mountain guide by profession. I started climbing mountains when I was about 16 or 17 ish. Uh, then I started as a porter to go up on Mount Kilimanjaro, but mostly I did because I, it was for me, it was for earning cash. And uh, it wasn't something to do as a fun thing to do or anything very interesting to do. So my friend took me and said, oh, you should come and climb Kilimanjaro with us. I said, okay, fine. And then I went, it was awful. I <laughs> saw and I was not really happy. I, I said so many things that I would never wanted to do it, it again in my life. So, but then he said, well, this is one time thing you can do and then you get used to it. Uh, then I kind of like it after a couple of times and then I became a guy. So long story short, I'll just go ahead and then uh, talk more about what I'm going to talk tonight and then uh, you get to hear more about myself and also you get to hear about our story uh, in Africa. Uh, Tanzania and Uganda are, have been friends for a long time mm -hmm. uh, since the, uh, of all the time. They're one of the earlier president in Uganda, and we supported even uh, some of your some of the movement in Uganda getting independence. But uh, we are just we're friends. Uganda don't speak Swahili. They do a little bit, but we have many languages in Tanzania. Tanzania has about 120 tribes, and we have more than 200 dialects. Uh, my dialect is Chaga, but the people you're looking at, these are different tribes. Those are Maasai. These are the Toga. These are the people who speak the click language. Those are pastoralists, or like uh, um, or the Kamajong in Uganda. But uh, in, a, in Tanzania, we're so blessed with so many things. The tribes, the land, the national. And this is the mountain where it's on the back of my house. I can wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, and look at it. And some people around it, they're like, what is up there? Why are all these white people are going up there? <laughs> are you sure they're just climbing or there's nothing there? I say, yes, I've been to the very top of it. 
there is nothing apart from glacier and there are the excitement of being at the very top. I'm married with the four children and uh, I've been guiding on Monte Kilimanjaro for more than 22 years. Uh, the climbing on Kilimanjaro took me over to climb Mount Everest uh, in the uh, year 2012, uh, then took me over back in US a couple of times. I've been traveling back and forth in US for over 22 years now. Uh, I went to New Hampshire with one of the friends that uh, I led on Kilimanjaro and we crossed the whole presidential traverse in one day. It was brutal <laughs> because uh, a short story of the uh, presidential traverse uh, is he's a one of my Everest sponsor. So when he was doing, we're doing Kilimanjaro, he asked me, can I go to the ash pit in the center of uh, Kilimanjaro? I said, yes. And this is like at the very bottom of the mountain. And uh, I knew he was, he was gonna, well, once at the summit, he's tired and what other chances he's gonna want him to go? I was wrong. He looked at me at the summit like, shall we go? <laughs> And I was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, we'll come into that one. But uh, uh, I've been guiding for most of my life uh, and I attained my formal education as a, a computer technician and I work as a computer technician, but then I diverted to being a guide. Then I submitted the Elbrus in Russia in 2014. And then uh, I, I look forward to my upcoming Greenland trip, which I have been training for the last couple of weeks in EV in Minnesota. Very, very cold, which my wife wonders why am I there? <laughs> <laughs> By just on a map, this is Tanzania in a, in a red there. Uganda is up here, and Kenya, Somalia, you go all the way. This is Europe over there. But Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in, the, in Africa and one of the seven summits. If you I know maybe some of you here will understand when I say seven summit or we have seven continent around on the world and it's a kind of a customary or mountaineering traditional thing someone wants to climb all of the seven summit highest peak on each continent and to name them uh, they with the order of the highest one Everest is one number two is a Concagua in Chile number three is the one in US anyone have an idea Nice. Yep, and Kilimanjaro, uh, then uh, Massive Vinson in Antarctica, and uh, uh, Kaksanza Pyramid in Papua. Then Kilimanjaro of the seven is the most easiest mountain in terms of it's a less technical, you don't require any technical skill to climb Kilimanjaro, and uh, it's regarded of a highest freestanding mountain that is not a range of mountains it's just like one mountain come up and it stand on its own uh, when I started as a guide I as I said earlier I started Kilimanjaro in 1990s uh, then I used my determination and the help of other friends I was able to go up and then become a guide then I worked with a guide and then I opened my outfitter called Kili Tricks Tanzania and that's a logo over there and I've been running the company, I and my wife and my partner have been running the company for the last uh, uh, 15, 15 years now. Then I recently, my son and I, we have been on top of the mountain because this is me trying recruiting him to see where he's gonna like. His passion is to become a pilot, but uh, I'll, he is interested to see where I work, where I get all the school fees and other things. Mm -hmm. So he started as a, he came up on a mountain with me as a, as a tourist and then uh, he tried again as a porter which to him it was very difficult he went back home this is him he went back home and told his mom like it's a very hard job and i don't want to do it ever in my life <laughs> <laughs> i said but yeah but he likes it but now he's taking he's taking care of most of the stuff but that's part of the kilimanjaro we'll come back to it later but my journey about everest so this is the everest it all started uh, about 2008 when I, when I met the first African to have summited Everest. So we climbed together. This is in 2008. Uh, we climbed Kilimanjaro together for the first time, for the second time, 2009. And then uh, mid 2000, early 2010, he planted the idea that we should do Pan-African Everest climb. 
And uh, um, I say yes, and I'm, I'm in, I'm completely in, because I wanted to see what it takes for what it takes for one person to go up on Everest. I've never been to such a big mountain. Uh, I knew it was dangerous, I knew it was most difficult, but I wanted to test my new level of experience, new level of uh, uh, challenge, and then see where uh, it will take me. Low cost depends on where you look at it. In Nepal, uh, they call it the uh, Sagaramata, uh, which means uh, the forehead. In uh, Tibet, they call it Chomolongma. It's a name, but uh, in early 1800, the first British explorer and uh, geographer, he went out there and they said, oh, you should name this mountain Everest. Uh, there is another similar story to this one where Kilimanjaro, the first attempt was in 1889, but earlier in uh, 1600, 1700, Queen of England gave Mount Kilimanjaro as a birthday present to one of his sons. <laughs> which, <laughs> that was kind of a, something interesting. It were, when you look at history, when you look at the colonial time, uh, kind of things interesting. <coughs> and the same applies here uh, with uh, uh, McKinley, which was the previous name now called Denali. Uh, but for me, coming from Tanzania, I got so much turned down when I was looking to go to Everest. When I, whenever I went out to look for the scholarship, uh, actually sponsorship, everyone say, what are you gonna do there? This is a white people business. You, African we know for the mountains. You should just go on Kilimanjaro to get your money. So I went around, the initial sponsorship came from one of the members of the group that I was leading Kilimanjaro. I was asking questions. So this was me planting the seed about wanting to go to Kilimanjaro, to Everest. And uh, I was told I would be leading one of the, uh, one of the group, which it turned out this, the CEO of Adventure Consultants was one of the members in that group, and he was uh, actually one of the leaders in the group. So I was asking so many questions about what it takes to climb Everest, and uh, so many other questions. One of the members in the group said, uh, Wilfred, Wilfred did a very good job, and uh, we'll have to sponsor his ex Everest expedition. And that's how all the sponsorship came in. Then I had to look for half of the, of the money, which was another Everest for me to climb before <laughs> Everest because it's not a thing in Africa, it's not a thing as uh, Glenda said, uh, it's not a thing at all for us because climbing mountains is not possible. Not to, not to mention when I tell some of the uh, European and American friends that I was gonna go to climb Everest, they say, you've never experienced any cold. You're coming from equator. If you are talking of minus 30 degree, you will die out there, don't even try. So those are the kind of things and uh, I, I was told, but got so motivated along the way. I say, why am I being so scared about this thing? Me, this, I think I want to do it now. I want to prove this, it can be achievable by someone. So I worked my way uh, from, so the initial sponsorship was put in in uh, October 2011. And I had six months to raise the rest of the half. We're talking of 60,000 grand. So half was put it in and half was I had to look for. Not to mention about years, not to mention about everything. But the question was posed to uh, the CEO of the Adventure Consultants by this guy, say, what do you think about Wilfred? Based on what he has done on Kili, do you think he'll be able to climb Kilimanjaro? And he said, yes, he will. We want to put money on him. So I managed to raise enough funds, and one of the one of the story is a guy who lives here in Boston. Uh, I told him, say, look, if we can go to the Ashfield of Kilimanjaro, and uh, it's fun, it's very good to look at it and say, oh yeah, I would like to do that, I would love to do that. Not knowing that he meant it and it was a business for him, he's super strong. He's a he's a very active guy. We get to the summit, tall people, and just one person look at me. Can we go to the ash pit now? <laughs> and I say, uh, yes, but I say, but you promise you'll take me? I say, okay, I'll take you, but we have to be quick because we need to join the rest of the group down. What's the ash pit? Ash pit, so when Kilimanjaro is a volcano mountain, uh, since the volcano mountain, when last time was erupted, it erupted and caused the core center to stay open. And that center is called ash pit. And that's where you, you you see like there's a plug-in, there's a big hole. 
I've been there several times, like to the edge down there, it's about 60 to 100 feet down, it's very deep down. And it's so wide, it can be about a mile 0.7, a mile 0.6 wide. So we're talking a very, very big hole up on top of Kilimanjaro. And the highest point on Kilimanjaro is one on one of the bank. And you're standing, that's the highest point, that's the recorded 19,340 feet. Just a little bit less than uh, Denali. That's why it's called Ashby. So the idea is you come from the top, you go down, you go up, and you stand on Ashby, overlooking down Ashby. And it's a very, very beautiful area. But once you've been walking for six hours from midnight to get to the top, it's the last thing you wanna do there. I mean, uh, we were talking today during lunch, I and Glenbury, you will have this wallet when you go up on the mountain, and when you're tired, if someone gives it to you, you say, I don't want that, <laughs> you throw it away. I've had cases where we took students up on a mountain and you show them a match or you give them a can and say, can you open that for me? Because they don't want to keep even a wrap. It's, a, it's too heavy. <laughs> so anything additional is like, it's too laborious. So no one wants to do any extra activity. So I took him down and uh, we came up, we went down, we met with the group. He was so happy. Previously, I, I had mentioned about my Everest expedition and uh, he said, hey, Wilfred, this group here will give money for you to go to Everest. If you ask them, so how do you know? They say, I know them, I'm from America, they'll give you money. And then in the end, I had to ask for everyone and uh, he came out, he say, I'm gonna put 15,000 for you. And I was like, in tears, I like, why are you doing this? I don't know you. I mean, we have met for one time, why are you putting all the money? He say, you're a good guy, you live on your promise. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you 15,000. And uh, that topped up everything on my trip and trip happened. So this is me in uh, arriving in uh, Kathmandu, getting ready for my expedition with all my gears there. Some I got sponsored by uh, Eddie Bauer in Seattle, the company, the clothing company. Some I got sponsored by the AC. And this is the travel from Kathmandu, we fly to Lukla. This is a small uh, airport, which is really, really interesting. It's, it's set up on the ridge side, so when plane lands, it has to touch before it hits a big cliff, otherwise it's done. And when taking off, it's taking off to the edge, so pilot has to take off before getting to the very edge. It's a very interesting place, and uh, traveling from Lukla to our Everest Base Camp is about nine days, and we travel through the village, and uh, we'll stop in the tea houses, we have all these bridges. It's a very fascinating area because with all these constructions, there are no roads, there are no motorbikes, there are no bicycles. They use people, they use horses, they use yaks. They build all these hospitals. You see a woman carrying a baby, going to the clinic. You have all these the farm, they grow potatoes. Uh, along the way, there is a tradition to pass by a monastery to get the blessing. And this is another thing I learned when I went to Everest. Uh, I, I'm raised Christian, Catholic Christian, and uh, in Africa, when you, when you look at the different religion, you don't divert, you're Christian Catholic, you're Christian Catholic. And I was there and I was like, okay, we have to go to the monastery to get the blessing to get the passage of the mountain. And I was like, oh, I think I, think I should do, because I want for my safety, I pray, but I want for my safety to be safe. If these people are doing this, I should follow. And we'll, we'll go to the, to the Buddha and then get the blessing, ask for the blessing, and if he does the prayer for you, you kneel down, you bow your head, you put his hand down, you put the white, the white clothing on the, on the neck, and you have to, to give some uh, anything as a gift to, to thank him. But the travel from Luklar to the base camp was quite interesting because one of the time we'll pass through the village and the kids would go to school. They run down the hill, up the hill, and we're walking slow and struggle. <laughs> and it's like looking at us, waving. It was quite interesting. It, we, that put it us in a situation to say, oh, so you could be accustomed to this kind of a life. It's just, we think everything is so difficult, but they're doable. And those houses you look at there, that's called a town called Namche Bazaar, where there are banks, they have the internet, they have everything out there, but there is no road no motorcycle, no bicycle, everything is uh, uh, improvised by human. Then we hiked all the way to the base camp and we arrived, we got a nice invitation 
I was so surprised when I got there because I, from Kilimanjaro point of view, we usually set up these tents and they're nothing big like that. Like you have a coat to sit on, uh, but I guess they do that because this is where we'll spend about a month and a half to get acclimatized, to go to the top and back and down. Some people, they ask me, so how long did you take you to climb Everest? And there, some of them know about Kilimanjaro knowing it's about seven days, six days, and say it took me 54 days. I was like, what? <laughs> and say, yes, 54 days. And you need this kind of comfort to have around you when you have to sit around for quite a time to wait for the good weather. Not to mention trainings. Uh, we had to do ice training because <clears throat> I've never done ice climbing before. So I had to do some of it at the base camp, but also for the good of the guide, they have to make sure everyone has a knowledge of how to do all these things when it comes to the high altitude. Not to mention to test all the oxygen gears, plus to do the puja, puja prayer. This is something you have to, it's another thing uh, with the Buddhism, you have to ask for the mountain goddess to give you a passage, a safe passage to go up to the top and back, to the, back down uh, uh, after summit. Then the, the climb up, to the summit start, actually the rotation, acclimatization rotation. So, <clears throat> first of all, there are about three weeks of going up and down. You do camp one, so from the base camp is 17,700. Camp one is about 20,000 feet. So you go to camp one, you stay there two nights, you go to camp two, you stay two nights, you come all the way down to base camp. You stay another day there, and you do the same procedure three times. This is why it takes a long time to get up on top, up and down the Mount Everest. So, and along the way, you pass all these area, like Kumbai's Fall, you pass, you pass the, um, the Camp One, whereby it's very vulnerable with, it's like in there, are enclosed basin, there is Nukte, Lotse, Face, and Everest, or uh, uh, Eastern, Eastern Bridge above you, where chunk and big chunk of snow or glacier can fall down and then just bury anyone in time. So you have to be careful, you have to be very quick uh, in making decisions, you have to be aware of your about and helping one another when you see anyone in trouble. So all of these happenings are within about a month to three weeks. Training to get to camp one to camp two and then camp two to camp three to make sure our body were properly acclimatized. Then finally we do um, a summit ascent Along the way, we came across someone who got really sick. He got struck. You see these chunks of uh, glacier here. This guy was hit by a glacier, and uh, they wrapped him in a sleeping bag and mattresses, and they tried to lower him down to get to the rest of the camp too, so that he could be rescued out by helicopter. But life up, <coughs> life up on there uh, from camp three, this is where we start using oxygen. And this is when you go to bed, you have oxygen next to you, oxygen tank next to you. When you walk around, that's a south call, camp four, about, 20, uh, about 27,000 feet. You go around to pee, you have your mask on, you have all the tank. It was like a very weird situation, very weird life. And I was laying down in a tent, looking out, I was like, it's so strange here. I mean, you don't care what people look at you, you do your business anywhere, that's the least thing you wanna care about. The most you care is just make sure you're surviving there. The means to survive is so rare, it's so small that everyone do their own thing around and nobody care. And you see people walk around like zombie. To walk from here to the door, it will take you at least the five minutes because someone is so slow out there. We're talking of 27,000 feet. So that's life there. And you're, you're, you're getting ready to go to the summit. So we'll, we left base camp on our uh, 12th, around 12th or 13th of May, and we arrived camp two, we spent two nights there, we went to camp three, and camp three, you, we sharing tent with, uh, I mean, with two people sharing one tent, and, and this has to be someone you have been together for quite a time. Usually, before we start to go <coughs> to base camp, they will try to pair people uh, at the hotel, say maybe, X and Y, you can be together, so and so, maybe you can be together. 
that way you may be able to spend the, the night or a couple of days up on the mountain together in one tent without fighting or killing one another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because what happened came to Camp 3, it's sloppy like this, very steep. There is no, at any point, you're gonna walk out of the tent without harness, climbing harness and crampons. And you have to be on the top. The moment you do that, it's a really, really situation that you have to go out. So what happened, if you have to go number two or number one, you do in a tent festival. This is why you have to have a tent mate where you can get along well without having to fight, without having to have anything. And you can help one another in a kind of a, when it comes to a situation. So I had a friend, I mean, I uh, shared a tent with a friend, now a good friend from London, called, his name is Neil. And uh, we had quite some fun time together and he had some rough time, I had some rough time, so we helped one another. But Camp 3, this is where we start using oxygen. And uh, um, we went early in the morning, going up, and this is when we met this guy coming down to go to South Cole or Camp Cole. And uh, it's usually a very slow walk. You have lots of people behind you. You have lots of people in front of you. So all those photos you see in the media, are, some are very true. It can be quite jammed up, and it can be quite interesting to, difficult to go up. Um, then we started going to the summit in the night. So the hike, different from Kilimanjaro, where we usually start at midnight. This one on Everest, we start at 8 p.m. We start by going up to the summit. And whatever you're looking at, those are stars. Not ice, no ice chips, no anything. Those are stars up there. And it was a slow move. Early in the morning, this is the view. Uh, I turned around. This is, I climbed Everest when uh, Hillary Step was still there. A year later, there was an earthquake, and uh, this this is a Hillary step here. It's a it's like a it's like a marble, and try walk with spikes on the marble. There's nothing holding to it. So this is an area where it was very tricky. <coughs> when, you, when we came here, there were like at least fifty pieces of rocks together, and you just because you don't know which one is the new one, which is the old one, you just hold like five or ten of them together. And you just have to climb up because you cannot use your mechanical climber, you cannot use your crampons, you have to pull up. Remember, we've been walking from the night, this is the morning, and this is like 20, already talking about 29,000 feet here. So this is like going here and your crampons are not holding on anything, you just have to hang on a rope until you get over to this region because the summit is just around the corner. It took about 10 to 15 minutes to walk 10 meters. That's how slow you get when you get up there. And this is me turned around and look like, oh yes, that's scary, but beautiful, beautiful. Then you arrive at the summit, oh, all you got to see is on the other side. And I had a picture before uh, from, from the internet and looking at that area, it looked like it's just like this podium standing 10 people all together. I'm like, oh, I should get moving. But then I think, you have the moment to celebrate, you have the moment to take picture, and uh, I tried to take my mask off to test what it feels like. I didn't last long, I was like, okay, I think this is good. About three, four seconds, I was all good to, to, to breathe in out. Then we took picture and started going down. The going down was nice and easy at one point, but once after 15 minutes, that, sort of, that uh, excitement kind of died down, and the uh, motivation to go down kind of die completely, you feel like, I think you'll get down when I get down. But guess what? The most difficult part is coming down. Because you, I was no longer motivated. And that's the case every time. I see clients on Kilimanjaro every day. I will take them up to the summit. On the way down, some of them, I think you can go ahead, I'll catch you. It's like, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead and I'll catch you. I said, well, I'm fine on the back here. <laughs> This is when you know someone is not thinking right. This, you know someone is really tired and they want to take a rest and you're like, you're bothering there. But you need the self-motivation and self-drive to continue going down because it's life and it's dangerous to be out there. Coming down on the Everest, I, I got on the South Summit and I had to sit down and I told the guy, I don't think I can walk down. And he looked at me, <laughs> he, this is what he told me. He looked at me and said, Oh, I think you need to try to get, to get down. And uh, I close my eyes and say, what am I talking here? 
and I reached out for the stuff to eat and I ate and I ate and I drank some water and I started walking down. As soon as I hit, I had the balcony, I started seeing things and like one of them was like colored stuff and I properly look at it, it was a dead body of someone like years ago. And I was like, oh my God, I think I don't want to join these people here. I want to go down. And this is what got me motivated. And I walked down. I never stopped at that moment until I got to the camp. Then we arrived at the camp. Everyone was safe. We stayed there for one night. The next day we went down to camp two. And after three days, we went down to base camp, had a celebration. Again, you have, we have climbed Everest and we are there down at base camp 17,000 thinking this will be fun and uh, we can just do whatever we want to do, but it wasn't. I mean, we were dancing to music that uh, they put it out to close as a ceremony to close their uh, their climb. It wasn't easy. You dance for five minutes and like, oh, why am I even dizzy here? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're still high. So that's a bit of our Everest, but uh, also like to touch upon a couple of things and uh, this is why do people travel and this is me why why i've seen people traveling coming to kilimanjaro i see there are two terminology traveler and uh, uh, travel and adventure i think they're either kind of the same or another but they carry different meaning travel is someone adventure is someone looking for something unknown travel is someone who has an itinerary but i picked up this uh our uh, saying from uh, St. Augustine, the word is there is like a book. If you don't travel, you read only one page. And uh, people travel for different reasons, uh, either for, for personal growth or for self-discovery. Uh, when you go out to do challenge thing, you learn about yourself, about new things. You join people, either you're going by a group or you go with a group of friends. Sometimes you used to go out every day or you meet sometimes on an end in a class or in school or out somewhere But when you go out in the field people tend to be more open people tend to be of themselves Truly themselves because they're no longer with a phone. They're no longer on the internet When it's time to think you open your mind and you think properly and you share ideas you share love and when you come to um, Learning and discovering obstacles it, it, it is something that uh, you can do that through different challenges and this is climbing mountain now you don't have to climb a mountain to challenge yourself you can go out cycle you can go on a smart, easy walk uh, but overcoming challenge is one of these uh, 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 activity one can do to learn about self-growth and uh, discover oneself but also you can do uh, bonding with the friends and do uh, a cause, a climb for cause, or activity for cause. Like we had uh, this group from Philadelphia, they did uh, Big Brother, Big Sister of Independent fund, uh, Fundraising by Climbing Kilimanjaro. A group of friends got together. Some of them knew each other, some of them didn't know each other, but uh, um, it was for supporting others while they demonstrate what it takes to do this kind of activity. Yes, we can give money, but also it takes someone's effort to do something. And this is them proving that it needed effort for them to climb a Kilimanjaro to, to be able to do this kind of a fundraising, but also you need to work out something together. And then that shows that um, you can spend the quality time, but also make it fun and help someone else. So this is about Kilimanjaro and this is about any other activity. You don't have to climb Kilimanjaro, you don't have to climb the Everest, but you can pick up your cause. You can pick up the field that you wanna be. Not only that, but uh, exposing you in the different areas. Uh, wildlife, learning about flora and fauna, learning about uh, different vegetation, why they grow in different areas. Uh, people know, I mean, some of the guys that we have, they, they know about what uh, tree and roots medicines, like they can be used to treat something. I know something that I could use in a forest. If I have a stomach ache, I can chew swallow the juice and but my stomach will get cured. Of course, I won't give to tourists, to, to clients, but uh, it is something locally we use and uh, has been proven to work. Um, then it's time to hang out with the friends and uh, do fun stuff. So this is one of the group that uh, we submitted. And I say, they're all, we told them, okay, you guys, you need to eat because we still have to go down. And this is after Sunday. 
Everyone is looking down, look at their balls and say, why don't you guys do a real one? I'll take a picture and they all acted weird and like, we don't know what happened. We went up and our mind stayed up on the, ta on the summit, so we don't remember exactly what is going on. That's the repetition of that one. But also uh, engaging. So when I say you don't have to do Kilimanjaro, but it also engaging with the different culture, culture and the, um, communities to learn about that, about the, about their ways of life. These are the Toga uh, people, one of the tribes in Tanzania. They don't live. They live a very, very interesting life. They live on the roots, honey, and and uh, animal. National park allows them to kill some of the wildlife because that's why they live on. They will eat monkeys, they will eat berries, they will eat fruits, and those are the things they will live on because they they are definitely they are not going in town any at all. They will wear dresses, but most of the time they will just leave. They're called hunt and gather, gatherers. So something to learn about them, and this is me with them trying to see, to ask them questions because these are university, I think, in uh, New York. They're trying to do research to learn about why why they live like that and how they live like that. Why are they not using the stuff we use, like butter, cheese, bread, but they still survive? And we're trying to gather as much information before they start doing research. But also, you can learn about history when you travel. You can learn about, this is one of the church, uh, one of the first church built in a colony time, 1700 or 1600 in Zanzibar. Um, we went there and uh, learned about uh, the colonial time, uh, the British, I think that was, a, a, not British, uh, Portuguese, they came and asked their um, sultans, because Zanzibar was ruled by sultan earlier, and they asked to build a church, and they say, oh, you can build one, and this is a church that was built in around 16, 1700. Uh, that's pretty much me. I welcome questions and answers. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Gus, let me see any questions. <laughs> yes. Um, was there a lot of garbage up there, or how did people dispose with, with um, I read online, I don't know if it's true or not. Is there a lot of garbage people go up? On uh, Everest? On Everest, yeah. Uh, no, because uh, right uh, during my time, and I think this is a practice, this is a continuation of a uh, practice they've been doing, that uh, every company has to dis deposit at least at least two thousand dollar, <coughs> and uh, upon return they have to show the trash that they've uh, produced, uh, including the oxygen bottles, because earlier those are the stuff that have been left on the mountain quite a lot. After oxygen use, it's an empty uh, aluminium or um, uh, what other material they use. Uh, whatever other material that makes it like, they will leave up there because they're no longer uh, usable. But nowadays they request all company to bring all the bottles and they're counted before they're taken up and they're, they'll recount them on, upon return. Plus another other kind of trash that will be produced. Base camp is cleaned by, most of the time there are shepherds, or actually yaks which come in and out, bring uh, loads of the base camp. And I've seen uh, yaks carrying trash to take out of the mountain. So it's pretty much clean. However, recently I was reading news that uh, they're trying to impose maybe this spring uh, uh, season, they will ask everyone to bring their poop out. Yeah, so that's some, it's a practice that has been uh, in place in uh, Aconcagua, but not on Everest. So people used to go down their, go down their, uh, their crevasse. So they say water is becoming more polluted and hence they, they are going to request all expedition to make sure their clients bring their work back down into the base camp and uh, there'll be trash management down there. <coughs> yes. With like uh, sending like such obviously like not just high altitudes, it's obviously like the highest altitudes, but when does does your um do your meals change the higher you get up like what you eat for source of energy? Yes, the meals change, but mostly they use a dehydrated food because uh, it takes longer to reduce the amount of weight uh, 
needs to be brought up on the high altitude, particularly Chem 2, Chem 3, and Chem 4, they, they bring a dehydrated food. And uh, the food is high in fat and carbohydrates. Make sure it, or it, pre it produces enough calories to make one continuous food. Yes. Uh, so you touched upon uh, traveling as like a moment of like self-discovery and realization and assuming that um, summoning Everest was a different experience than your 147 plus <laughs> exhibitions of Kilimanjaro. Uh, what did you discover about yourself in this particular trip or was it more of like a reminder of a, of a dis uh, discovering moment that you've had in the past? Uh, I have discovered many, many things and one of them is I thought, first of all, I, I didn't know I could climb, I could do ice climbing. That was number one. Number two, I never thought I will be able to do such a difficult thing because I remember there were so many times on Everest I wanted to give up because either uh, it, was a, it was a 90 degree uh, glacier wall to climb or it was too cold and I couldn't sleep in the night. Uh, and another one was the breathing through the oxygen. But also, um, uh, I had a, I had the same mindset uh, previously that uh, before even climbing Kilimanjaro, I had the same mindset that uh, these things are made for white people because they have been coming to Kilimanjaro. They're the only one coming to Kilimanjaro and climbing. Locals, I mean, I have a relative who climbed Kilimanjaro and he went on a uh, write an article in the newspaper, but before he did that, he went and asked for statistics. The number of locals who climb Kilimanjaro do not account to 5% of the total number who climb Kilimanjaro. So that tells me like these things are, we, we, are, we are stereotyped that these things are made to be for certain kind of people. And that has even proved to me more that, oh yes, this actually, there are things that can be done by anyone who is determined and who wants to see the world in a different eye. Of which now, as I said earlier, I've skied for the first time in my life uh, about two to three weeks ago, which mm -hmm. was quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned you were a Catholic. Um, during your expeditions, was there a spiritual moment with God or uh, I guess in moments of doubt, did you call upon God? Uh, yes, I remember particularly at uh, one point. I remember the rest of my life uh, being in the middle of the glacier wall, not being able, not being able to continue up, and not being able to continue down. And uh, I was like crying, and I started praying and say, "Okay," because I knew if I let my go self, I have to hang on a rope, and it will be only for few seconds before I let go because it will be burning my hands. And everyone was shouting to me, go up, you can do it. Quickly, we're getting cold down here. And someone was like, Lil, get off the rope. We, we want to come down, get off the rope. Like there was like noise everywhere. And I was like crying and everybody, someone, I, I could hear someone saying, Wilfred, you can do this. Remember, your crampon steps, your crampon points has to be straight, not at an angle. Because I was trying to be smart playing physics as I'm trying to learn new things like, oh, maybe I should dig this way on my point and I will hang on, but that is just digging like this much and I will come up because it will not carry my way. And digging that way will not even do a thing. And trying to hold on to the rope and climb with my hands could only do me good for 45 seconds because my hands will be tired and I'll never be to, to walk up. So those are the moments, that's one of the moments I remember very vividly. And another one was coming down when I was sure that I wasn't gonna make down because I was so tired. And I was like, how can I die here, God? Because I have my family and uh, <coughs> good thing, most of, people who, most of people who knew me, they never got, got an idea, a full idea of what was happening, except my sister who then kept ringing the company now and then, is my brother like me? <laughs> <laughs> and she told my mother, and my mother, she cried and asked me, why did you do that? <laughs> you could have died there. Yes, so there are moments that I had to uh, pray and ask uh, God that uh, I get down safe. But definitely, uh, I relay also on whatever they 
uh, belief in terms of uh, talking to the Buddha and the Buddha do a puja prayer and asking for the mountain goddess. They have like five different gods. They have god of wind, god of fire, god of uh, uh, what else? I lost them. I can remember about. They have like five gods. They have to ask them individually for the passage and make sure you return back safe. Yes. There was a hand. Can you climb? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I know in the Everest region that the climbing industry has completely like revolutionized the entire area in terms of providing jobs and everything. Would you say the same has happened in the villages near Kilimanjaro and where you're from? Um, is there any like similarities or differences between Kumbu and Tanzania? Uh, there, is, there is a huge difference, but uh, Kilimanjaro is, there's a, I mean, there's not much you can compare because uh, Everest, you're talking of traveling miles and miles away to the base camp. Uh, Kilimanjaro, uh, right at the bottom, is the town, it's a city, uh, and everyone lives there. And uh, the city has been in place since around early 1800. Uh, so there were Indians and the Arabs before then, and then they came German, and it was so well developed. There was even a, a rally track that came from the coast to the, to the area, whereby then it came the, I think that was the Second World War when the British took over the country, and uh, um, the British stay on until we, can, uh, we gain our independence in 1961. Uh, I think you undersold the, the reason why you came to the U.S. this time uh, with, in relation to the green sort of thing. Because at lunch we had an interesting conversation uh -huh. about this whole ski and the Greenland thing. I, I I remember telling you that maybe you should share that too because it involves a lot of fasts with you. First day, first day, first day. And what you actually are going to do there and how you explain it to me. Maybe it would be of interest if you share that story. Too. So... Um, I'll see if I can find the, uh, the video. But anyway, just uh, out of blue, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> this is me uh, in uh, one of the lake, a frozen lake. Uh, <coughs> two years ago, we were sitting in a tent on Kilimanjaro and uh, I and my friend were pondering, where else should we go? And uh, I say, I wanna do polar. I want to do one of the polar uh, uh, end, either South Pole or North Pole. I say, yeah, but that's expensive, but I don't know. And then uh, I say, but what about Greenland? I say, oh yeah, that's, I think that's probably doable. Until recently when we started pondering and uh, coming into conclusion that maybe we should do Greenland. And uh, our <clears throat> it turned out my trip in the US collided with the training they call Shakedown. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my trip here <clears throat> collided with uh, the training uh, called a Pol Expo Pol Explorer Shakedown, which happened in uh, Minnesota, in one of the frozen lakes there, uh, the town called Ely. So it was one week, uh, early, early February, so they say, if you want to join the Greenland trip, you have to participate in this trip. So this is me trying to travel the world, exploring the world, breaking the barrier of understanding which things are made for who, but I think everything is made for everyone, as long as you're determined and uh, you, have, uh, you have seen the ways of doing it. So this is one of the area that we were camping out there. Uh, the training took place in, in the Ely, and it was about one week. And uh, the idea is to cross Greenland end of April to sometimes uh, mid-May. And it's gonna take 25 to 30 days. Our skiing, pulling a sled. A sled is gonna be about uh, 170 to 180 pounds of food and camping gears. And uh, the temperature can range between uh, 30, <coughs> 30, when it's about 30 to 28, that's the warmest day in Greenland. So the lowest temperature goes, uh, the most, the most, the lowest temperature recorded was minus uh, 63, and that was sometimes last year. So <coughs> I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but uh, I'm looking forward. <laughs> uh, I, I mentally prepared that uh, uh, this is gonna be like that, 
but also I'm trying to make sure I have enough clothing. Uh, but also I'm working with the sponsors now to make sure I, have, I can raise enough funds to take the trip on, but also to get all my equipment done. But it was, it was a quite an interesting conversation with uh, uh, Kalemba here, telling him like, you have an opportunity here, or you can go out skiing and say, ah, I've tried it, I fell so many times, I think it's not a thing for me. But also it's not a thing for Africans. We don't, there are no places in Africa to ski, apart from one in, uh, um, say the Tunisia or Algeria, they have a small ski resort out there. But where we come from, there is no way to ski out there. So that was me in our early February trying to get myself uh, together with the skiing pad and pulling a sled, plus camping in a frozen lake. So this is a, the fire that's on a frozen lake uh, up in Italy. And uh, cool. we're gonna for emphasis, you have never skied in your life. Until you went to Minnesota. I put in my ski for the first time early weeks of February. And you're going to ski across green. Correct. <laughs> 25 days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. Really, so many interesting and cool things. Um, as, a, as a commercial guide yourself, and yes. also like an individual explorer or adventure traveler, how do you reflect on like, the commercialization of all of this? You know, the, the, we, as someone who's never climbed anything serious, you know, like you read about Everest being a place where only rich people can go, or that people who aren't climbers go, they just pay lots of money. I wonder, but at the same time, guides are the people who make things possible for the rest of us who have local expertise and who want to share that with the world in some way. So I guess I'm curious how you think about. The role of a guide and the and the sort of what what the increase of adventure travel has done to the sense of awe and wonder and exploration that is out there in the world. So I can I can I can answer that in point of view of Kilimanjaro, but also I think I've seen Everest and uh, it it's a bit it's a bit on the extreme side and so is Kilimanjaro. But there is a fine line between. Uh, uh, enthusiasm of people who want to learn and there are people who want to check on a bucket let's say this is a checklist and I just I've done Kilimanjaro but you have a lot of people who have a passion and want to explore the new extremes in their life but as Kili Treks Tanzania we are part of an organization called Kilimanjaro Auto Assistant Project and we get looked upon uh, by the organization to make sure we do we do this we do our trip ethically now, that goes into how much we pay our porters. I mean, are the individuals on the days being, being a main benefactors of the, or of the uh, activity? Uh, but also we abide into rules of leave no trace to make sure everybody know what they're doing. Most of our porters are in the program of leave no trace. And uh, they've been trained on how to make sure the environment are well kept. Now, there is a degree where it gets so busy that some of the things get forgotten easily, and that's understandable. But every year we'll do cleanliness on the mountain uh, to make sure the mountain stays clean. Uh, that helps us to make sure in a coming season it's, it's within its origin. We cannot guarantee making sure that everything will stay the same because there's tent pitching, there are people walking with their trekking poles, uh, people using the sites to go number one, number two businesses out there. You leave marking on the mountain and hence it changes their, um, a lot of our information, a lot of our other things for the animals who live out there. And so you see nowadays raven, monkeys start going after guides and porters back because they know that's where the food is. We no longer want to eat dairies out there. There's an easy food usually come with this guy. So these are the things we try to tell everyone, but there is a very fine line between trying to split the government policy, especially when you look at these countries where they are mostly third world countries where they, they heavily depend on these uh, um, economic or uh, tourist attraction as economic uh, uh, enhancement to their, to their uh, funding. When you look at Everest, they, it's a main, it, it contributes to their country about, it's a country, contribute about 30% to the uh, GDP of uh, Nepalese, and so is tourism in Tanzania. When you look at Serengeti, 
sometimes you feel like, oh, I don't need to see these animals because they are so scared of cars. Too many cars looking. You have like 20 cars looking at one lion killing a zebra. And that lion is like afraid of eating there. It's meal. It's like you being in a restaurant and you have people watching and you eating your burger. <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> how you eat your bag, how you chew it. And it's, it, it's uncomfortable. But it's so publicized that uh, it's hard to you have to 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 separate the two. The, the economic factor of it, like it's so much needed, but also to control it. Who wants to policy that? Uh, oh, we have enough people this year. We don't want any any people, any more people. Like our government now is trying to make sure by 2030 we have five million tourists in the country. And I was like, that's crazy. Do we really need it? Uh, but again, there are so many other resources which could be explored out there and uh, hence make it country reliable on other activities and preserving these natures for the future. So that was me in Italy, anyway. I'll, I'll see you. Okay. Um, one more thing. I will try, if you have time, I'll try to play this. This is small. I'll try as short as I should. Do we have the 20 to 10 minutes? At least. Sound. We might you, you try the remote that's under the TV. Uh, no, it's playing on this one. Oh, it's playing on your laptop. Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, this was me recording this going up and. Uh, it was a quite a good challenge, uh, quite a, quite a scary to cross those lines. You may have seen in our, the new the new Everest season. I think they have they have they're showing how these ladders are being put up. So this is just a two minute one. I have a longer version. Uh, this is me arriving at the summit. And that's after the Hillary step. Yeah, you have to let go of the people coming down, and uh, you have to pass going up. Everyone is everyone is in rush of either going down or going <laughs> going up. <laughs> That's a part of the going up uh, before going to the summit called the uh, yellow band. Our country flag. So even this flag, so this flag says a lot and I kept it. I didn't left it. People ask me, did you left it there? I said no. I kept it because it has a meaning with me. So because there is so much uh, unknown about us climbing mountain and everything, when I went out to the government and asked for the when you ask when Tanzania when you ask for flag, flag is an uh, is a government thing. You cannot have a personal. So you have to go to officials to ask for one. And I had to go to ask for one. And uh, I was like, no, we cannot give you one. I said, but I'm doing this. I say, oh, yeah, but we don't have money for that. <laughs> so I had to go around and other people, and I got 
get a, get a, someone who will say, okay, we'll write your paper and then you can go get it. So this is me flying, flying in the afternoon and I'm getting the flag in the morning. Uh, not to mention that this is one of the organizations in the UK that supported me. Not to mention when I went to one journalist and say, can this be official that I'm traveling as a Tanzanian to go to climb on Everest? I say, yeah, yeah, let me call someone. And they call one of the men in town and say, oh yeah, but can he buy the flag and they will hand it to him? And I say, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna go. <laughs> Is it not a ritual to like, uh, put a flag up there when you get there? You put a, those, the one you saw, the one you saw there, those are called prayer flags. Oh, those are prayer flags. Prayer flags. So, and that's when I say they represent uh, different goals. There's a yellow, green, blue, white, and red. So you get that from? You get that from the bottom and then you, tie, the you tie that at the very top, yeah. And you tie that as a part of the ritual to ask for the, uh, the mountain goddess to give you a safe passage on the way back home. So there are no country flags up there? No, nobody, no. You, cannot, you cannot even say. Oh, okay. it, because it's so windy up there, very windy. Those ones, they just tied on a rope around and uh, every, that's after every year they can keep accumulating and then they will they get blown away also. Okay. Yeah. Another question here? Yes. How are you recording? I had my camera uh, attached inside and I usually put my down suit over, but I usually, I, I will have it under my jacket and I'll take it out and I'll press record and then I'll leave it and then just do like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put it back. <laughs> Is it hard to like move your fingers? Very, very, very hard because uh, you always have you always have meetings, and uh, you have to have in gloves the glove liner. You can never stay without gloves on, and that's when you I do that quickly and then I press the record button and I'll go around <coughs> with my jacket and move on. Yeah, <laughs> but not with the phone <laughs> because I lost one of my my Googles because. I was trying, I had it, I had it here, and I was trying to do something with my eyes, and when I put my hand up, it flipped mm -hmm. over, and I watched it going to Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that, I watched it going to Tibet. So imagine you have your phone, and you had your all recording out there. It was, oh so God. I say, okay, I'm not losing my camera. Fully attached here with me, and uh, uh, if anything happens, then uh, I know where to get it. Yes. All right, guys. Uh, your time. Uh, I want to thank especially Maria who's not here, Sophie and Eric for helping uh, put this together. Um, when I thought of you coming, I was uh, I reached out to Eric and he was very supportive and helped uh, together with Sophie and Maria thank you, Sophie. to really make this happen. And thank you all for coming and giving us this one and a half hours of your evening. And hopefully it was worth your time. One more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.